Hi, and welcome back to Continual. It's another episode of The Panel Room. I'm your host, Jim Nettles, and tonight we are diving into what everybody wants to hear. What do we as writers wish we'd known before we got started? And so before we dive into this and get all the mistakes that we've made, let's find out who is bringing their share of the experience to the table. So Rachel, you are up first. Thanks, Jim. I'm Rachel A. Brune, and on the publishing side of the house, I am the founder and editor of Crone Girls Press, which is uh, specializes in horror anthologies. I'm also the senior editor at Falstaff Dread, which is the horror imprint for Falstaff Books. And I'm also a writer, um, and my book Cold Run came out from Falstaff Books in December, and that's a whole story of doing things differently all along. <laughs> So I'm looking forward to tonight. Jack? Hi, I'm Jack Cullen. I write a series called Recollections of a Rune Knight. It's an urban fantasy series about a city where all the magic users and magical creatures hide out between ages of magic and the police department that has to enforce the laws. I also have a series coming out in September uh, with Evolved Publishing called Locke Ferguson versus the Aliens, the first book. Locks Galactic Mass will be out this September. And I have a YouTube channel called Books, Bullets, and Booze, where we review indie books, talk about the booze and the weapons in the books, and uh, occasionally I am by said alcohol. Lee, please save us. Um, you're really dreaming tonight, Jim. Um, I'm Lee Perry. I'm also Tony Kellner. Um, I've been writing murder mysteries. My first one came out in 1993, so this will bring my 30th year come June. Um, so I've made all kinds of mistakes over three decades. I also write as Lee Perry these days, and I write about a murder mysteries about an ambulatory skeleton named Sid. Shauna? Hello, I am Shannon McGuire. I write an unrealistic number of books under an unrealistic number of names for an unrealistic number of publishers. I have been assured of the fact that this is unrealistic just this week when one of those publishers got upset that I had somehow moved all of our deadlines forward two weeks and was asking him where an outline he was supposed to flip around today was located. It's located next week. Um, and uh, we're video, right? Absolutely. Okay, and then this is Kelpie. She is a five-month-old Calabie Maine Coon, and she has never done anything she regrets in her life ever. <laughs> and Sarah. Hi, I'm Sarah J. Sover. I am the author of the Fractured Face series from Falstaff Books, which features a pissed-off fairy godmother and dots hunting the serial killer who offed her first princess. Um, Falstaff also re-released my debut novel, so we'll get into some <laughs> that led to that situation, but it's a comedic fantasy called Double Crossing the Bridge about a group of drunk trolls. So I want to kick this off on a nice, light, and easy question. If you had, if you'd known what you know today, before you started down your career path, would you have followed it to where you're at today as a writer? Rachel? <laughs> I don't, I don't think so, to be completely honest. Uh, as much as I love what I'm doing right now, um, I started off writing as a military journalist. So I joined the army in 2002 as a military journalist. I really enjoyed that. Um, and I probably, if I knew then what I know now, I probably would have looked more into academic writing and nonfiction and done a bunch of that before I even thought about moving into the fiction world. Um, and there's a couple of different reasons for that, but I had a lot of expertise in one area and it definitely was not fiction writing or publishing or anything like that. Um, so yeah, I probably, I'd probably be doing something different now. Jack, how about you? Uh, yeah, I, I'd go down the path. I just would have gone down a, a lot earlier. Um, I started writing late in life. Uh, it was one of the things I always planned to do, but life kept getting in the way, and finally I did it. I wish I started 10, 15 years earlier. Lee, how about you? 
I'm, I'm pretty satisfied with the path I've taken, but kind of something I wish I had known starting out was that, um, that there's so many other paths now. I mean, back in my day, they were, when I first started, there was anyone who self published. It was vanity publishing. It would ruin your career. And I got this, I got that in my head that that was, that was, you had, this was the way to do it. I wish I'd been a little more open minded to realize there were a whole lot of different paths. I'm happy with the path I, t I took, which was very classic. I got an agent who sold the book. I've been aging in pretty much the whole time. You know, kind of that classic, the way they used to tell you you had to do it. But I wish I knew that, no, you don't have to do it that way, especially now. There's so many other different routes. And I wish I'd been a little bit more open minded sooner. Shauna? Yeah, much as Lee says, um, I did the things you were supposed to do when those were the only things that were options. And I'm kind of glad that other things weren't options when I did because I am fundamentally very lazy. Um, I just want to write books, hand the books to someone else and have everything taken care of and not have to think about it. And I think that if you put me into a position where that was not a, a deciding factor, it was just you can publish as much as you can write if you do it this way, I'd be putting out 30 books a year and contemplating jumping off the bridge into the Seattle Sound. Um, so I, I don't know that I could have done anything different. So much of what I did in getting started was luck and timing and just hitting the market at the exact right angle. Sarah? Absolutely. Um, I'm still <laughs> relatively young in my writing career, um, but I am really happy with where I am right now. Um, I mean, I'm sitting on a panel with Sean and freaking McGuire. I mean, come on. Um, so I'm, I'm, I have learned so much going this route. I tried to go the more traditional route to begin with, um, with a very trope ridden epic fantasy that I'm so glad was not my debut novel. Um, and then I relaxed some, stopped taking myself so seriously, wrote Double Crossing the Bridge. And it was the perfect novel to debut with because I mean, <laughs> you don't connect with drunk trolls. Uh, okay. <laughs> like, I don't, I can't take any of the, that criticism, you know, to heart because it's so ridiculous. And then I ended up with Falstaff, which is a absolutely wonderful place to be. So I'm happy with where I am and I have plans for the future. I would like to, at some point go the agented route and, and all that. But right now I kind of owe John my soul. So <laughs> I own three more books right now. So it'll be a while. And I'll, I'll kind of add this because the, and I, I'd actually kind of go with a little bit of what Rachel said, because when I started my career, I started in media a very long time ago. And I, you know, when I was young, I got lucky. I sold a couple of pieces that, that went out short work fiction sold. And then I quit fiction for a very long time, not for any other reason than bandwidth and traveling. And, and I was doing plenty of other nonfiction writing some of which was academic, a lot of it was business, a lot of it was media and periodicals. But what that taught me in that time period was how to write fast, how to write tight. Um, but there were still a lot of skills there to have to learn to go with fiction again. And probably the one thing I wish I'd done was gotten back to fiction faster than I did. Um, that to me was kind of the one thing I wish I'd just gotten back to sooner. Um, so with that idea in mind, um, you know, and Jack, I'm going to start with you on this one. Start thinking in terms of, you know, what's one thing before you really did set in on the path and start putting words to paper, trying to get stuff published. What's something you wish somebody had come in and told you before you started down that path? Make sure you have an editor that's a good fit. My first editor was the nicest person in the world. Fantastic. But kind of let me push her around. Uh, so I didn't get the... So the book wasn't quite as good. I need. I personally need an editor that's going to go, no, no, that's stupid. You're not doing that. And I kind of, you know, I pushed my first editor around and the book wasn't quite as good. I got some very good constructive advice, went with another editor that was willing to take a stand against me. And this is nothing against the first editor. Like I said, wonderful person, good editor, just not for you. I, I well, I kind of ran her over. 
Um, and, uh, you know, my next editor stood up to me. So you, you got to have an editor that's willing to say no and say, hey, look, you know, I've been in the business X amount of years. This is the way you want to do it and make you see sense. Uh, so I definitely would have done that different. Um, that being said, my first editor would a great editor for other people. Just wasn't didn't work for me. Lee? Um, say the question again, so I'll make sure I'm answering the right one. Well, just thinking back in, in terms of your time. What I wish somebody had told me. What's something you wish somebody had told you before you got started down? The path? Um, gosh, I can think of a bunch of things. One that to tell me that everything's going to change. And I can remember sitting in a publisher dinner where the editor swore up and down and says, not to worry about these new ebook stuff. It's just going to be a tiny little sideline, you know, like audiobooks, which, of course, not a tiny little sideline now either. But she, you know, she was, had years of experience. She was a very smart woman. She was wrong. And so even the very smart people can be wrong because it, things change so quickly. Um, and the rate of speed, uh, rate of change seems to be increasing, although maybe that's just me. Um, I wish someone had told me kind of there's a lot of different ways to define success because I think as a writer sometimes I, I'm so busy looking at where other people are and what they've done and I wish I were doing it I wish I wrote faster like Sean no one can write as fast as Sean and, but I wish I could um, you know I wish I had more awards I wish I had you know bigger sales you know I, and instead of looking at what I have done and what I you know I've done some stuff I'm very proud of and I wish somebody had said you know Think about what's really important to you in terms of success and go after that. Don't try to go after everything because no one's going to get everything. Just kind of pick out what you want and enjoy enjoy the ride. John, how about you? I honestly wish that someone, one of the big problems is when we say we wish someone had said something, we also mean I wish someone I would listen to had said something. Someone had said in a way that I was prepared to hear. Yeah. The writing doesn't matter. You want to think that the writing is the important thing and that uh, that literature and science fiction publishing is 100% a meritocracy and nothing else is going to be a factor ever. That is completely incorrect. I have literally had my fellow authors say to me on a panel in front of readers that fat authors should not leave our homes because it damages our brand. Um, my two primary names are Sean and McGuire, which is the actual me, and then Mira Grant, which is sort of my dark twin. And I have had sufficient people come up to me at signings that I stopped counting because it was beginning to degrade my faith in my own readership to tell me that if they had been aware that Mira Grant was Sean and McGuire, they would never have picked her up. Because all urban fantasy is vampire porn purely for women. And someone who writes vampire porn cannot write good hard science fiction. There are so many people who will not read books by female authors. There are so many people who will not read books by authors with non-English sounding names. Um, if you are known to be physically disabled, Jewish, over the age of 40, or overweight... There are people who will choose not to read your books because you are not someone they would want to sleep with. I am not exaggerating any of this. I wish I were. And I wish someone I could, I would have listened to had come up to me and said, you know, hey, it's oh. it never going to matter how hard you work. It's never going to matter if you write the single best book in the world. Not just the best science fiction book, the best book in the entire world. There will still be people who hate it because you were a woman while you wrote it. And if you're a guy, there'll be people who hate it because you were the wrong religion or the wrong political party or the wrong age when you wrote it. Mm -hmm. It's that old adage, if you're not a $20 bill, not everybody's going to like you. It applies to being an author too. And that sucks so bad. I get so upset when people are like, oh God, that McGuire lady, she just writes scuzzy urban fantasy, whatever. And because of the changes that you know, Lee was mentioning, where we've moved into this rate of change in internet and social media means folks have, have no qualms about telling you that to your face or via Instagram message that you didn't ask for all the time. So the world is a series of psychic landmines now. Or just what they'll dump into your social media feeds, what they'll dump into all sorts of places. Mm -hmm. 
So Sarah, how about you? Um, there's a lot. I mean, I, I've been learning a whole lot since my debut novel released in 2019, and I've been a sponge since then. Um, but I think I, I really wish that I had um, really thought about the use of a pen name um, or that somebody would have told me that it wasn't just that I had to change you would use a pen name just to change your gender, or obscure the fact that I'm a woman. But because I have two daughters and I was like, I'm writing science fiction fantasy. I thought very strongly about getting a pen name so that I would, people wouldn't pick it up and put it right back down, like Shauna was saying. But, um, and I was like, no, I've got two little girls. I'm going to, if I'm going to do it, I'm going to do it as me. But I didn't think about the security aspects. I wish I would have picked a pen name that was feminine. Um, so that I could still have that. But um, um, anyway, I didn't. Um, but also, I think the other big thing I wish that I had known was, I wish somebody had explained to me the limitations of small presses, like from the very beginning, because the press I originally signed with, they asked for a marketing plan up front. And I was like, oh, great, we're partners, we're going to do this. And I developed an extensive marketing plan I, I'm an all systems go kind of person. And so I'm like, we're going to do this. I've got this, 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 and this. And then instead of sitting me down and being like, no, this is not something that we can do with what we've got and telling me where I should focus on my marketing plan. They just led me to believe that we were going to do all this stuff. And I wasted so much of my energy trying to make things happen that were never going to happen for me there. Um, and had they said, oh, okay, we can't do this, this, and this, but if you want to focus on, you know, developing a newsletter or, you know, the things that I've kind of learned along the way from people like, like you, Jim, and, um, and John and everybody else at Falstaff, then I would have not maybe burned out so much on some of the marketing stuff that I was trying to do. Rachel? Um, two things come to mind. And like Shannon said, I wish that someone had told me these things and that person had been somebody that I would have listened to because um, there have been times in my life where I've been absolutely sure that I was doing the right thing. And if you had come to me and said, hey, you know, you might want to rethink this, I probably would have been like, no, I'm going to do it. I'm going to make it work. Um, have you that, told me that? Uh, but the, the first one is very much that if you see somebody doing all of the things like they're killing it on social media and they're writing this many books a year and they're doing all of the things like they've got a Patreon that they update every day and their newsletter goes out on a regular basis and they never, ever, ever are late or miss a week or two. <laughs> you know, if they, if they're doing all of that, then they either a have help or b less responsibilities than you do. And you cannot, if you are in a certain place in your life, do all of those things. Like if you have kids, um, if you are a reservist, an army reservist, even though it's part time, that's still a good chunk of your time that you're not going to be able to be doing other things. Like you just can't do all of it. Um, and I recently had to sit down and kind of take a step back and look at, hey, uh, I'm I'm not going to be a social media influencer. That's not who I am. And instead, what I can do is focus on um, networking. And that kind of brings me to the second thing that I wish I had known, which was what a great resource the writing community is, especially if you find the right writing community. And the and when I say resource, I don't mean that other writers are your audience. Uh, and I don't mean that other writers are your competition. What I mean is that there are so many very generous people in the writing community. And if you approach them the right way, and if you are polite and professional, and you go to conventions and you net and you participate online in, in online writing spaces, there are a lot of people who will be very, very generous with what they have learned kind of like in this panel to help you not make the mistakes that we all made. Yeah. There, I mean, there's definitely a lot of value in making different mistakes because there, there, we all are going to make plenty of them. And if you're not making a lot of mistakes, you're probably not pushing hard enough either. I mean, that that's one of those hard truths is 
the lessons we learn from, you know, experience is what we needed to have 15 minutes after we screwed up, right? And sometimes it's small, sometimes it's big. But at the same time, one of those things that, and I, you know, I've seen, I've heard, I've gotten, and even sometimes I've given bad advice because you can't necessarily give anything other than general advice unless you dive into and have a really deep conversation with somebody to know where they're going, what their needs are, what their capabilities are. You know, like what Rachel was saying was, you know, what's somebody's personal capabilities to do marketing and a lot of these things. So what's good advice for one person is often not good advice for somebody else. So Lee, what's something that's a piece of advice you hear often but that you know a lot of the time is bad advice. I know that one thing I heard a lot when I started out was uh, write short stories first and then write novels. And the idea was to get published and you'd get some attention, you'd get your feet wet, you'd be able to get an agent, all these things for writing short fiction first. Somehow this totally ignored the fact that short fiction and novels are not the same animal. I mean, they're similar, they all use words, but so do haiku and limericks. They're not the same thing. And I think that was a big deal to me as I tried to write short stories and I kind of sucked at it. And for me, I did better at the novel length. And once I wrote novels, then I could kind of pare down, pare down, pare down and learn to write short stories. But it was no telling me to write short stories first was incredibly dreadful advice. People also talk about write what you know. And yes, but no, um, because it, uh, it doesn't allow for the facts of the things you want to know, the one things you want to learn more about. And don't, writing what you know doesn't mean to be writing just like yourself. A friend of mine, Richard Merrick, was a uh, editor at St. Martin's back in the day. Um, one of Thomas Harris's editors, I think. And he once got uh, one of his his uh, son's college roommates sent her sent him her uh, memoir of growing up, you know, growing up in Harvard and being Jewish community and all this. And she never got the point that she wasn't adding anything that anyone in those she wasn't adding anything interesting. She was just writing about herself. You can write what you know, but you've got to explain it to other people in a way that they're interested. And so to write what you know just isn't sufficient of advice. You need to have a little bit more clarity of what that means and how that can be valuable writing. How about you, Shauna? So I hear a lot, I think we all do, write every day. <coughs> that is... Uh, that is classist, that is ableist, that is sexist, and that is frankly harmful. You know, in our culture, the majority of household tasks do fall on the female partners. Now, whether that is by choice within your relationship or just that's how my parents did it, so I default, it does mean that female authors tend to have less time. If you have any sort of disability, whether mental or physical, you may not be able to do it every day. If you have chosen to have children, you may have other demands on your time. A writer does have to write, that is necessary. But if you're forcing yourself to sit down and write every single day and beating yourself up when you don't, you're not making good words, you're making words out of obligation. Uh, when I first really started, I was not writing every day, I couldn't. I had a full-time day job and a four hour a day commute and I liked to sleep. I had given up the day job, the commute and the sleeping. Um, you know, you'll find the time if that's really what you want, but starting with that all or nothing goal is just going to do you damage. Sarah? I think any advice that doesn't apply to you, doesn't resonate with you, and especially advice that makes you feel like you're failing is bad. Um, I am an ADHD mother of two young children. And my process does not look like um, many people who are giving advice. <laughs> okay, I, I write in short little hyper-focused stints. Um, my, my word count goal is like right now for what I, when I wanna get my next book out is I think it's like 250 words a day. It's, most people would scoff at that. I don't know how I write books, but I do. I've written four of them now and I'm, you know, I've got another one in the works. So, um, I think anything that anything that limits you or makes you feel like you're doing it wrong is bad advice. Um, and I think especially um, advice that makes it seem like there's only one path. Um, when I started off, I'm, I'm happy that I tried to start off the traditional way. I spent a lot of time on Twitter doing Twitter contests and stuff. And I ended up really kind of um, 
refining my elevator pitches pretty well. Um, I, I learned so much doing going that route, but then I ultimately went sm the small press route. And I'm a part of the um, the debut 2019 group for people who um, were traditionally published. Then they they have indie um, presses lumped in with traditionally in this um, context. And I saw a lot of my friends who went immediately big five felt so much pressure to repeat their initial success and ended up not being able to do so. And I feel like I am, I'm glad I'm not there. I don't know if I would have been there if I had gone that route because I didn't, but I feel like everything that I'm learning and building right now is I'm creating something with my career. And that was a great path for me. That was exactly, I'm exactly where I need to be. But that message that that was the only way that you could go. I mean, had I accepted that, I would not be very happy right now, so. Rachel? So I don't know who is out there giving advice to writers that they should go and spam reading groups and writing groups with links to their stuff, but stop it. Don't do that anymore. It's annoying. <laughs> um, I There was a at our local library, they had a writing conference a few years ago. And one of the people who were there giving advice advised people to go onto Amazon and to find books that were like theirs and then leave a review that mentioned that their book was like the book. I was like, that's terrible advice. Any sort of advice that, again, tells you to use the the writing community as your target audience is probably terrible terrible advice unless you're writing like unless you're like a multi-million dollar author writing a book on how to write books that might be the only time that I can think of um, but yeah I've, I've come across some of that advice and kind of been like that sounds really terrible but somebody's out there taking that advice because I have to keep an eye on the spam in our crone girls press group all of the time well, and we, we get some of it in continual as well, um, which is, and with some of the changes that are coming in legislation and everything else, where you are becoming more and more responsible for what gets posted in your social media groups, where you are responsible for, for a lot of these things. Um, again, generally what we see is people who, and I do want to talk about those marketing lessons here in a minute, but I think this is one of those things of don't do to someone else what you don't want to have done to you. I believe that old parable fits along those lines. Um, that came from um, one of those saints, um, Bezos, St. Bezos, yes. Jack, how about you? You need an agent. You need an agent or you can't get anywhere. Um, we live at a great time for writing. Uh, you can self-publish. There's indie publishers, there's hybrid publishers, though you got to be careful with those. Uh, and there's the big five. There are a lot of different ways to get published and getting an agent first doesn't have to be the way to do it. But uh, that's advice you hear a lot. And it, if it works for you, that's great. But that's not necessarily the only path. There's so many different choices these days. Yeah, and one of the things I'll add out there is if you are trying to get an agent, be very selective because again, um, just because somebody's an agent doesn't really mean they know what they're doing. doesn't mean they have the connections in the industry to actually help you at all, or that they even know really what the business is because yeah. anybody can hang up their shingle to be an agent. And then even if you get somebody who is a solid, connected, experienced agent, doesn't necessarily mean much like an editor, they're a fit for you. But the big difference is if you sign a book deal, you guys are going to be, it, it's, it's harder to get out of that agency relationship than it is to get divorced. Yep. I, so, uh, I was talking to one and I'm like, I got a problem with this contract. And he goes, well, you don't understand contracts. I'm a lawyer. I have a pretty good idea of how contracts work. And it basically it was, he didn't know what he was doing. He was trying to get into the business. And the problem with that is the writer suffers on his learning curve. You know, as this person gets established in the business, he's going to make mistakes and his mistakes, his clients will suffer on it. Um, I mean, there's some great agents out there. Don't get me wrong. 
but be careful if you you know if you go with one, make sure you get a right one, and you don't necessarily need one to begin with. So, one of the biggest lessons, and one of the hardest things that everybody gets shocked at when I when I do workshops and people ask questions is, and I think everybody's probably going to have an idea of where this is going because we've already hinted at it. Pretty much unless you already have enough of a following and a large enough readership that you don't really necessarily need the marketing dollars, you're going to be in a position where you're responsible for most, if not all, of your marketing. And you're the one that's responsible for your branding, your career, all the rest of that. When we, when we think in terms of the amount of time and effort and work it takes to build a reputation and a career and a brand, and or in some cases, multiple brands, multiple names, multiple pen names, and maintaining all of that. You know, so Shannon, from your perspective and how you've gone about things, what's advice that you would give to somebody about that idea of building a brand, building your marketing engine? I am the worst is, is honestly my answer there. I make my publicists cry on a fairly regular basis. If you go to my Instagram, which, you know, they're always like, oh, be on Facebook, be on Instagram. I, I only use Facebook to purchase Generation One My Little Ponies and occasionally original Magic the Gathering artwork. Uh, my Instagram, you have to scroll several pages before you get something other than magic cards or my cats. Um, it is unusually marketing heavy right now because there are two whole posts on the front page that are about something related to my work. Um, my, my publicist kind of wants to drown me in a sum. Really, the only reason I was able to build a brand, as they say, is that I am very, very good at Twitter. I feel braggy when I say that, but that's not really a life skill. Um, you know, I'm one of those people that gets accused of lying on Twitter all the time because I'm good at telling Twitter stories. I figured out how the breathing of the application works. I'm very stressed out that Elon Musk is going to finish murdering it and I'm going to have to try to learn something else because I do not have the face for TikTok. I don't want to go there. That's not my natural environment. Um, and I have cute cats and I'm willing to exploit my cute cats. But I went to a whole lot of conventions. This was in the before times, before the Panini came along and changed the mathematics of, do you really want to go out and hang out in a convention center with other humans for five days? And, you know, after taking two years to just sit in my house, I really don't. I do not want to go where the humans are. I don't want to put on a bra. I don't want to put on shoes. I don't want to talk to you. I'm sure you're a very nice person. But I don't <laughs> touch me and it makes me want to die. Ah. But I, um, I also have ADHD and mine is comorbid with a healthy dose of what's called rejection sensitive dysphoria. I take any sort of rejection or feeling mocked very, very badly and was consequentially an extremely neurotic child because I felt like the world was attacking me constantly. So they enrolled me in stand-up comedy classes at 11 to try and get me over my stage fright. Uh, the end result of this as an adult is that I am, fuck, I am really, really, really good at live convention panels. I am funny, I'm reasonably erudite, and I am good at explaining what I'm trying to get across. So this makes me a strong sell in a convention environment. I've had a lot of people come up to me after panels, especially zombie panels when, in which I would regularly spank Max Brooks verbally um, to tell me that they had bought my books because I was so funny. You're so funny. I'm going to read your books. You know, my books are full of corpses and murder, right? not fun not oh okay you do you um but i'm a terrible marketer terrible so sarah you got to follow that one up <laughs> <laughs> not entirely sure how um i think i think what has worked for me is finding that nexus of what i enjoy or at least doesn't make me want to peel my skin off and um and what i'm good at um I think like anyone who tells you you need to be on all social media platforms is setting you up to fail because 
you can't be. Um, I was primarily on Twitter for a while. I have stepped back from that because of the, <laughs> the things that are going on over there. Um, and I am now on TikTok, which I am struggling with. However, it has been, um, John went viral talking about my book at one point, And I have noticed a direct correlation with my cute little Amazon graph and the number of times I post anything on there. So I have to keep doing it because um, I will do whatever I need to do at this stage. But um, I do think finding finding what doesn't make you miserable. And then also, as far as branding goes, I've mostly leaned into certain parts of my, like genuine parts of my personality and just played them up some. So I can't, um, I, I am incapable of lying. <laughs> like completely like it's terrible you'll you'll laugh if you see me try um so i really need to kind of find the genuine pieces of myself that i number one don't mind putting out there for public con consumption and um number two i'm able to kind of play up some so um i definitely try to lean more into my more fun side um my kids would be completely they, they come to conventions with me sometimes and my nine-year-old is like yes it's a different mommy it's a different mommy there <laughs> <laughs> so that's just worked for what's what worked for me i'm reluctant to give advice because like i said anything that doesn't resonate with who you're giving advice to is bad advice so rachel we're, we're talking marketing correct we're, we're talking marketing and branding i i will just tell you that recently i went through a whole like this I had a crisis, I had a crisis of brand and a crisis of confidence and a, just a crisis. <laughs> um, and honestly, I think that m the only advice I can really give from my experience is don't do like push your comfort zone. But if it's not someplace where you feel it's a natural fit, don't force it. Um, because people will be able to tell right off the bat that it's not authentic um like sean and there's a reason why i'm not on tiktok i tried it i got some fun laughs and people seem to like my basset hound but i was like this is not something that i need to be spending the time that i'm spending here i should probably be actually spending writing <laughs> um but on the other hand people and and more than one have said hey i like your facebook feed it's funny and i live to give people a bit of humor in the world as it is today so i'm like all right let me lean into that not to market anything but just to make who i am be a fun place to or just to make the place where i am online be a fun place for people um, and to, I guess if that's part of my brand, then that's part of my brand and I'm going to lean into it. But yeah, tw uh, Twitter, Twitter was really great. But again, like we're kind of talking social media platforms here. And the crisis that I had was when I realized that it's not about the platform. It's about who I am and about how I want to be present in virtual spaces and so I had to like spend some time offline, just like thinking about who is that person? What aspect of my personality am I willing to share with people? Because I do enjoy going to conventions and I do enjoy talking to readers and writers. I just had a really wonderful experience at Scares That Care Author Con um, last weekend where we hung out with all our favorite horror friends. Um, and so, yeah, I'm like, I, I can totally do this pushes my comfort zone as, as somebody who does kind of just prefer to sit in her room and read a book, but still comfortable to do. And so I think, like I said, I guess my point is if it's, if it's something that you absolutely hate doing and you open up that platform or you open up whatever you're doing with like a sense of dread and I don't want to do this, like, don't do it. There's so many other options for marketing. Go do one of those, especially if you find it fun. Yeah. I'm horrible at marketing. I'm so bad at it. I was so bad at it. I was dragging con and I was lamenting I was bad at it. And this weird guy named Jim Nettle said, Hey, you need to go on continual. And look where it brought me. Uh, you bought me a drink. That's what, that's what conned me into. You bought me a drink. 
Um, I did. I bribed him with whiskey. Um, yeah, you, you, you do got to find what works for you. I'm like TikTok. I don't understand TikTok. I, I, I feel so old when people start talking about TikTok. I just don't get it. Um, Twitter. Yeah, I do a lot of stuff on Facebook. Um, I, you know, I mentioned earlier, I got a YouTube channel, Books, Bows, and Booze. Plug. See what I did there? That's marketing, people. Um, mm -hmm. Well done, Jack. Uh, well done. Beca because I can talk. You know, I try to, you know, type something out for Twitter and I just kind of seize up. I can talk forever. You might not want to listen to me, but I can do it. So YouTube works for me. Something like this works for me. So you, you got to find what fits for you. If you can, you know, you don't mind being on the screen and showing your face, something like this is great. If not, Twitter is good, things along those lines. It's got to be what matches you. That being said, Remember, first thing I said was, I'm horrible at marketing. Lee? Um, I have to repeat the advice that everyone says, don't do it if you don't enjoy it. Um, I tr tried on Pinterest. People were saying, oh, things are great on Pinterest. Pinterest did not work with my head. Uh, so I don't do TikTok. But I kind of like Instagram, so I've been kind of mer merging into that. I was never big on Twitter. But I, I, Shana was saying that the publicist hate her because she's talking about other things. Honestly, that's what I want from a writer or for a celebrity or someone I'm following. I want to find out about them. I don't want to look at their feed and have every single day. This is my book. This is my book. This is my book. This is my book. Here's the back of my book. Here's the front of my book. Here's the side of my book. And there are some people on Facebook and they try to friend me and I go look at their page and that's like every single thing is about. I don't want to read that. I don't want to read someone's newsletter every day. Every week's pushing it. Once a month, that's fine. But I won't. Certainly, I was talking to a writer at a voucher con, and she was like, I'm trying to decide whether I should do my newsletter weekly or daily. And it's like, what What do you have to say every day? I really don't. Um, but it helps, I think, to kind of to pull, pull from your personality what you want to share, like Sarah and Rachel were saying. Um, but if you can somehow tie it sort of to your interest, which is your book. In my case, I write about uh, the right to family skeleton mysteries. I mentioned he's an ambulatory skeleton named Sid who solves mysteries with his best friend, Georgia. And so on Facebook and on uh, Instagram, I do a skeleton of the day. I don't do it every day. And which I'll, an uh, interesting fact about skeletons, a cute picture of skeletons, um, a joke about skeletons. Anything, and it gets to the point where people will, and I'm pretty sure there are more people who follow the jokes and will talk about, oh, we just love Sid, blah, 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 who actually buy the books. I think they just like the idea of them more than they do the books, which which kind of is my other lesson. Don't do stuff unless it, either you enjoy it or it moves the, the dial. If you don't see the numbers increasing, if you don't think these people are translating, you know, just because you can have 3,000 followers on Twitter and still not sell any books because people aren't there necessarily for the books. So that's kind of where you want to juggle what you're interested in and enjoy versus what's actually selling the books and try to keep in that happy spot. And it's not always what you think because I bought books from people because I liked their posts that had nothing to do with their books. And I've read posts by people about their books, which convinced me, nope, not ever going to read that sucker. I think you just sold your books to me. <laughs> <laughs> Good job. <laughs> Sometimes it works. That's, you know, one out of six. That's not bad. Well, and I mean, one of the things that, that you know, we often preach is this. A, when you're going to be out in public, when you're going to be in front of people is helping to create that persona. You know, what are those pieces of yourself you want to share with the world? You know, what are the things that you want people to see and know? Because, you know, in the good old days of being a writer, Nobody had any idea who you were, other than maybe a tagline. They might have seen the occasional interview or an article or something, but nobody had an idea who you were beyond the fact that words appeared on the page. Okay, great. Now we have that expectation of wanting to know who we're letting in our heads, whether it's fiction, whether it's nonfiction, whether it's media, whatever. We want to have some degree of connection there that's personal. And I think this is where that idea of your newsletters, your social media presence, I agree 100%. It should not be buy my book, buy my book, buy my book, buy my book, buy my book. By the way, do you know I have a book? Buy my book. <laughs> it's who are you? Are you somebody I want to let in my head? Are you somebody 
that whose ideas I want to allow to influence me and, and bounce around in there. And I think that's one of the most important things is be who you are, be comfortable with who you are and be comfortable with what you're sharing with the world. Because one of the hardest parts can be you're becoming at least some sort of minor public figure. If you're doing stuff like this, if you're at a convention, you're speaking or you're in a booth selling books, whatever you're doing, not only are you the creator, you're also becoming some sort of public figure that people are going to see and know. And a lot of people are going to be incredibly supportive and some people are going to be outright assholes. And the problem is you have to be ready and willing to take both and swing that band hammer for the people that you're like, nope, you need to go. And that's hardest when it's people that uh, you might even know in person. One thing I want to add to him, if you don't mind, is um, you talked about that people expect to know more about the authors they're reading than they used to. And that's kind of dangerous for the authors. But I found it very encouraging for the other writers, for the newer writers, the aspiring writers, the kids. Um, when I went to my first Sisters in Crime meeting, which is Sisters in Crime is a big organization now, but it was a baby organization then. There were six people there, and one of them was the mystery writer, Susan Conan. And it's like, oh, my God, it's a mystery writer. She's a real writer. She's published books. She's publishing one next week. And just the fact that I met someone, and she was really just kind of this nice, normal lady, was, was so encouraging to me. It's like, oh, you don't have to be tweed jackets with patches on your thing you don't have to be anything specific that normal people write books well maybe not normal but normal yeah, don't, there's no normal people on this call this is true I, I was gonna say you're accusing writers of being normal oh, for, for writers we're normal <laughs> it's a low bar i am the human norm <laughs> yeah huh yeah Jack, and, and you can and, send me another one of those drinks if you can. yeah 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 no problem you know what this is reminding me of is a Saturday Night Live skit where they're talking to William Shatner. And, you know, how many horses do you have in your farm? 16. Does that include the foil you just had? Okay, that's 17. Yeah, your fans can learn a lot about you. Um, but you also always want to have a positive image, too. If you have a bad day, you still, if you're out in public, you're at a convention or whatever, you got to project positive because... One bad word can just ruin your reputation. And they ruin a lot faster than they build up. Yeah. yeah. And people are so weird. I'm sorry. Go, Rachel. I was going to say, I wanted to specifically riff off of something that Jack said, which was having a bad day. And I definitely want to differentiate between um, like being hangry towards a fan uh, as opposed to being authentic online, because I think that it's unrealistic for us to always have like a super happy go lucky persona online. Like I personally try to be very positive um, and just like, like I said, have my virtual space be someplace where people can feel good. But I also have times where I'm struggling yeah. and I'll just, I'll be like, Hey, here's the honest truth. I'm struggling because I think that for me, at least I used to think, oh, you know, it is easy. And this is kind of going back to something that I said before. Oh, this person can do all of this. And I think sometimes it's very healthy for us to be honest about struggling. Mm -hmm. Whether it's, hey, I didn't make my deadline or I didn't make my word count or this book, did, you know, it got rejected from its 30th agent. <laughs> right. Um, I mean, that's nothing. <laughs> Amateur. Those are amateur numbers. <laughs> On the same note, it's also important to sometimes think about what not to share. You know, we joke about the fact that I write rather upsettingly quickly. Um, that is not a secret. That is true. I don't give out my daily word count numbers because when I used to, I had people who were literally doing themselves harm. I had people who would go, if I can't write as many words in a day as Shannon, then I lose. And they were making me out to be the villain at the end of their video game level. And I don't want to be the thing that causes other people pain. You know, I will intentionally not clean a carpet before I take a picture for Instagram or whatever. You have to show that you're actually a human 
and not just polished, perfect, and everything is easy. Or you can hurt people because unfortunately we are public figures now. We don't want to be, and it sounds super arrogant to say that we are, but I was at that perfect age to watch the media eat Britney Spears. Mm -hmm. What we don't talk about much because it's no longer relevant is I auditioned for the same year of the Mickey Mouse Club as she did. Oh. I was a child musical theater nut. Like I, my original plan in life was to get a theater degree and go to New York. Um, then I broke my back and that kind of went away. Uh, but I auditioned for the same year as shit. And there was nothing in the tryout process. There was nothing anywhere where they said, if you get on this show, you will lose all privacy 24 seven and people will follow you around with cameras. Like we make, we made fun of her at the time for having her nervous breakdown in public, but she signed up for one thing. And what she got was something 10 times more invasive. And the same thing has happened to anyone who started publishing within the last 20 years. We signed up for one thing and what we got was a panopticon. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But because we got are, death threats from the way yeah. she, she ended her series, she got death threats. Oh, I remember uh, that was super fun and I enjoyed it a lot. I got to hear her say some words that I had never heard her say before. And it's really nice when you can get Charlene to say horrible words because her accent makes them so cute. It does, it very much does. It really We're talking does. about Charlene Harris that when she ended the Sookie Stack out there, she literally got death threats from people. Wow. It's the crazy. most sucked up thing ever. Mm -hmm. And we are we are accessible by nature of needing to market ourselves on social media. You know, people have to be able to reach us or we can't sell them books. And we are so, we are celebrities to the degree that people just want our attention. But sometimes they don't know the difference between good attention and bad attention. And that does mean it's important to be a little messy sometimes and to be a little imperfect sometimes, which I think we're all really good at being imperfect. <laughs> I, I nailed it. You did. Perfect. And yay, that was the best delivery of your of your one once an episode swear word. <laughs> it fit in. I'm so proud of you. Yeah, I'm giving you eight and a half for that one. <laughs> Tough crowd. <laughs> and, it should be. Yeah, one of the things that I think is really important, um, you know, is again that idea of w there are still people on the other end of this. Um, you know, it was, it was an entirely unrelated conversation to publishing, but I think it's still relevant is that we have to remember that there are people on both sides of this. You know, our fans are out there. If we've done our job right, yeah, we make them feel a lot of things. And, you know, there's that sensation at the end of the series. Did I get what I wanted? Did I go for the ride I wanted? But at the same time, there's also the times that we write stuff that draws hate mail and other things like that. And again, this goes into having an idea of what identity you share with the world. And this can go back to that idea of a pen name. Now, the reality of it is, even with a pen name, a little research, it doesn't take much much these days to really figure out who somebody is. They're only going to provide so much protection anyway. There's a lot of other reasons to consider them, have them, other things like that. But without going too far down that rabbit hole, um, it, I want to kind of throw an open question out there to everybody. And Sarah, I'm going to be starting with you. Um, you know, because no matter what, with these kinds of conversations, we've all gotten a ton of advice over the years. We see a ton of things online. Some are good, some are bad. Some resonate, some don't. But when we go about and go through these lessons, when we do a panel like this, we never have the opportunity to discuss everything that we could or we'd be here for days, right? So this is kind of that open-ended question. What's something that to you, you think somebody that is interested in publishing, coming into publishing, or maybe even somebody that's been doing it for a while and could be struggling or looking for that motivation? What's something you think that that person needs to know? So Sarah? I'm probably the worst person on this panel to start with on this one. Um, because my experience is very limited at this point. I have only been with two publishers and they're both small, small presses relatively. And um, 
So I'm, I'm not sure that I, I feel like I have more to learn from this question than to speak about. So I'm going to pass that one. All right, Rachel. Oh, geez. <laughs> um, two things. Uh, the first one is it's this business is one of the most fun ones that are out there. The, especially if you, if, especially if you have a lifelong love of books, because if you had told middle school, Rachel, going to the library, picking a Tanya Huff book off of the shelves, reading it, loving it, wishing I could just like be like Tanya Huff someday writing books. Like that seems so far away that that was never, ever, ever going to happen. And nowadays, like, I'm, I'm friends <laughs> with Tanya Huff on Facebook, right? Like, people are, people who love reading can find the people who are creating the things that they love. Sometimes that's a negative, but I also think that there's just so much an of an opportunity for that to be a positive thing. So I think that if you're, so the first thing, you know, if you love reading, if you love books, if you love literature, this is just such a great time to be, you know, someone who loves that. The second thing that I would say is if you're a writer, you're a creative entrepreneur. And hey, it's my book. <laughs> I have, as a matter of fact, and recommended it many times. Um, but don't don't shy away from that entrepreneur side of that phrase. Uh, money's not dirty. Money's wonderful. <laughs> knowing how to knowing how to market and knowing how to sell your work that's not a terrible thing. And there are books out there that can absolutely help you learn how to not just market your book, but like I said, if you're an entrepreneur, that includes things like business plans, like marketing plans. Like, you know, going into the business section of your local bookstore and picking up a book on how to be a solo, um, a sole proprietor, you know, so having an idea of the business side of things is not really a bad idea, especially when you're just getting started out, because then you won't be someplace after you've been there for a few years going, what do I do with state sales tax? And should I do an LLC in North Carolina? <laughs> Jack, how about you? You are not alone. The writing community is fantastic, in my opinion. Uh, there's so many levels of it. If you start writing, go to your local library. There's usually a writing group. Show your writing to other people. Uh, get critiques. Uh, eventually get beta readers. Go to the communities. Meet other writers. Take advice from the senior ones. Uh, it's it's a good time. Don't be, don't be intimidated. Um, it helps if you don't realize who they are right off the bat. I'll give a perfect example. Um, we're going to throw Dragon Con out again. I'm there one year with Jim and uh, a bunch of other people. And uh, Bobby Nash introduces me to uh, his friend, Mike. And I'm like, Mike, nice to meet you. He's like, Jack, how you doing? I had been hanging out with him a year later. Then Bobby tells me his last name. It's Michael Stackpole, Star Wars. And I'm like, I would have said two words to this guy if I knew who he was at the time. And I was drinking with him and we were taking stupid pictures and we're having a good time the year before. Um, the writer community is very, very fun. Everyone I encountered doesn't take themselves seriously. They don't have an attitude, no matter how many books, whether it's a hundred books they've published or whether it's one book they've published. They're all willing to talk about their mistakes, what's worked for them, what hasn't. It's it's a community. And if you want to write, get involved in that community because you will learn so, so, so much more than buying a book that said, you know, how to write a novel. Uh, or, you know, even I'll even say so much as taking a college class with some professor who's talking about how to write the, the next great American novel. Get in the trenches. Talk to the people that are actually typing on their laptops. They got a lot to tell you, and they're great people. Lee? Um, this is this sounds depressing, but it's really not. The money in writing is generally not very good. The average uh, advance has not gone up in 40 years. 
It was around 5000 for a first novel. When I started, it's still for it's about five thousand for first novel. That's the, you know, that's the average. That's not the mean. That's the average. So that means you know, the, the celebrities who make way up there, and those who get no advance whatsoever. Um, but there's more to it than that. I mean, I don't think you, most people should not expect to quit their day job any more than most actors can make a living at it. Any more than most, you know, minor league ball players probably have to do other things on the off season. That's true of any kind of creative endeavor. You may not get rich at it. It's worth it if you enjoy it and you do good work. And maybe you'll be wildly successful and maybe you won't. But, you know, if you think of it that way, it's like uh, talking about being an entrepreneur, um, I heard a, I think he was a, he was a cartoonist and he was in, he was a, did a lot of work in kind of the anime and manga field. And he recognized that he probably couldn't make a living at what he wanted to do, which was to do original books. So we started kind of going on the uh, 10 streams of income, 10 different streams, which was very entrepreneurial, where he sold postcards and he sold t-shirts and he did some of this and he did some of that. And he had 10 different little jobs. And sometimes that can work for a creative, but most of us in order to get insurance and lovely stuff and holidays and stuff like that, still have to work a day job. I worked my day job for until I got pregnant and I couldn't be a mother and write and have a day job. Uh, but my husband has a day job to get the insurance and stuff. So it's very hard to be a full-time writer. And don't think that that means you're any less of a writer. It just means you didn't hit it lucky this month. And it's, 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 it's okay to keep creating that way. Sean? I, I kind of lost what the actual question is. Can I have it again, please? Sure. Is there anything we haven't talked about tonight you think we ought to talk about? Okay. A um, little bit connected to, uh, to what Lee was just saying. The single best piece of advice I was given once I actually hit the point of, okay, you have figured out how to finish a book. Because really the most important piece of advice, if you want to be a novelist at least, is figure out how to finish a book. That process is different for everyone. I can't tell you how to finish a book, but if you can't do it, you can't do the job. Um, the single best piece of advice I was given after I figured that out for myself was do not quit your day job until you can pay your monthly bills off your royalties. That's your measuring point. If your goal is quitting your day job, which, you know, as Lee says, not everyone's going to get to. Um if your goal is quitting your day job, don't even start to think about it until those royalty checks are covering the bare basics of, of living. There are months where I only eat out of the discount meat bin. Um, and, and that's that's normal. That is how this system functions. So that and no one can teach you how to write a novel. There are a huge number of people who are happy to take your money to teach you how to write a novel. They're not going to teach you how to write a novel. They're going to teach you how they write a novel. And that is a very different thing. You know, we were talking about who keeps giving this advice of advertise yourself on other authors' bulletin boards and other authors' reviews. There are entire writing conferences just dedicated to that advice. I was invited to be a speaker at one of them and, and I didn't know, so I went and I got there and it was a cult. It was straight up a cult. It was claiming to be a writing conference, but they're talking about how your job is to write 100,000 words a year, period. You're going to make this much money. You're going to do th these things and they'll guarantee you success. And every member of your tribe is going to buy your book and talk you up. And it was, it was like walking into a very high cult of personality um, offshoot of an actual mega church, but claiming to teach you how to be an immediately successful writer. So yeah, there are folks that are paying to be told that the way that they are going to make their career is by going to Jim Nettles' website and advertising themselves all over his forums, just period. And know that I have, you know, I swing heavy objects and I swing a band hammer pretty damn worse. Yep, but because they paid money for that advice, that advice is clearly more valuable than what they could have gotten from listening to this panel. Yeah. So. All right, Sarah, since you skipped out on to leading them with the question, did Fine. anything you, come to mind? Yes, of course. <laughs> I'm on a panel <laughs> with genius people, so of course something springs to mind. <laughs> no, um, 
I think probably the thing that helped me the most was letting go of my own expectations. Like I put so much pressure on myself that I stagnated writing for years. Like I started off with really crappy poetry and then I moved on to um, thinking that I had to write something that would alter the perspectives of the reader. <laughs> like I went through a phase of reading things like Ishmael and the Celestine Prophecy and things like that. And I'm like, I want to write something that completely like blows people's minds. And I ended up like for so long, I was just stuck. Um, I had this one weird project that never would have sold anywhere. So I'm glad I didn't finish it. Um, and then I did an epic fantasy. I was like, I'm fine. If you can't do that. I'm going to write this big giant epic fantasy. It's going to be groundbreaking. And in preparation for this panel, I went back and I pulled up my first queries to agents for that project. And I got re-embarrassed for myself. They were so bad. <laughs> like I had no conception of what number one was already out there. Number two, what my place in this world was going to be. And number three, what I had written. I mean, what I wrote was it was an it's an underdeveloped, full of tropes with a decent backbone and story that one day I may go back and fix, but it needs two more books. And I just don't want to dedicate my life to that. Um, I wish that I had just like let go of every, all those pressures I put on myself earlier, because once I did, I was like, I'm just fine. All right. Well, this one, nobody seems to want this book. So I'm just going to write something that makes me happy. And I did. And I am so freaking proud of it. I'm writing it sequel right now. <laughs> um, and it, I just, it was such a better way to go. And now I have all these other ideas and all these other books that are waiting on the back burner because I, um, I've i joked before in panels, I call it um, the, the epic fantasy was the constipation plug, the icky stuff that has to come out before the good stuff does. I have to stay, stay good. But anyway, I've, got, I've just got so much more to put out there now. And um, everything, all of my own torture has been self-inflicted. So it, it's really just a matter of like, taking down those barriers for myself. And I hope that that helps somebody. I don't know. <laughs> well, guys, I think this has been a great panel and hopefully, hopefully the audience will get a fair amount out of it. But before yeah. we get out of here, let's mm -hmm. make sure everybody knows where to find you guys, of course, websites and social media. And what's that rate latest release that you got to go push. So Rachel, you're up first. Absolutely. So I have consolidated all of my links onto Linktree slash Rachel A. Brune. And you will find uh, my work, Crone Girls Press. You'll find the podcast that I do every once in a while. Everything Rachel A. Brune is on Linktree. Um, and my latest release, as I mentioned, is my werewolf secret agent thriller urban fantasy cold run. Jack? Uh, I write Recollections of Runite. The first book is Runes of Steel. Uh, it's an urban fantasy series. I have a new series coming out in September, Locke Ferguson versus the Aliens. The first one is Locke's Galactic Mist. It is a alien abduction action comedy. Uh, you can find me at jackcullenwrites.com, uh, various social medias as Jack Cullen Books, and on YouTube as Books, Bullets, and Boots. Lee? Um, I don't have anything in the pipeline right now. I'm working on a couple of things. I'm working on my seventh family skeleton mystery, which is going to be set at a LARP summer camp. Um, and this, my daughter went to LARP summer camp. I steal all my stuff from my daughters. And I'm working kind of on the, the research things of a heist set uh, among high school parents, where one of the high school parents is a former con artist. Um, you can find me online on Facebook, both as Lee Perry and as Tony Kellner, you'll mainly just see pictures of skeletons and bragging about my kids because, you know, it's what I did. Um, I'm on Instagram rarely, also making, showing skeleton pictures. And uh, two websites, TonyLPKellner.com and LeePerryAuthor.com. Donna? Uh, well, in about five minutes, you can find me at Zulu's Board Game Cafe because I am 20 minutes late getting there. Uh, you can find me at seananmcguire.com. I am still on Twitter, even as it circles the drain. If you want to see a lot of pictures of my My Little Pony collection, you can find me on Instagram. It's mostly ponies. We have a nice time over there. Um, and it is now April. So my most recent release is Backpacking Through Bedlam, which is the many 
Um, it is the 12th book in my encrypted series from Daw Books, uh, published, they are a division of Astra House. And uh, don't don't buy that book. Buy Discount Armageddon, which is the first book in that series, because if you buy book 12, you are going to be so confused and you're going to think I'm a really bad author. Sarah. You can find me at sarahjsover.com across most social media platforms as Sarah J. Sover. Um, my most recent release, I guess, was the re-release of Double Crossing the Bridge, which is a uh, troll caper. Um, it's about a group of drunk trolls who rob a bridge. Um, the book that is um, coming out soon, it is in edits right now, is the second in the Fractured Face series, uh, the first being Fairy God Murder. So you can pick Fairy God Murder up now, and hopefully by the time you finish it, I will have a release date for Fade to Black. And I've had the pleasure of being your host tonight, Jim Nettles. You can find me at jamespnettles.com, authoressentials.net, authoressentialsworkshops.com, thespecficacademy.com, creatingpros.com, and of course, here at the and Shannon, go game. Yeah, bye.